Um, I have two questions. My first one is, um, when kind of strong emotions come up, anger, fear, or a lot of thinking, so I bring up my mantra to uh, cut through it. And sometimes it seems to me like the man- me bringing up the mantra is just kind of a way of avoiding these emotions and thoughts. And that in many ways, maybe it's just like, you know, I'm angry or I'm sad, so I go eat something, I go watch TV, I go do something entertaining. And uh, so my question is, how does a mantra not just become also another way of escaping? Well, the mantra has a very special property. It doesn't have the label of Hanan over it. Everything else you mentioned, all this karma, has your name. Your specific name and form over it. You created it. And as you say with the mantra, you cut through. When you cut through, only the mantra remains. All that junk, which is in your mind, everybody's mind, my mind, is gone. And finally, since you don't do this for yourself, it cannot become a hindrance. You go help someone else if you're in such a good state of mind. That's all. Next. Okay, thank you. Uh, my second question is, um, one of the kind of strongest desires I feel that within myself and I think in society today in general is kind of a digital media. And um, I'm wondering if you have any advice on how we can work with that, with all these stuff that are so strong and are literally programmed to take us outside into them and not look inside, but also not disconnect completely from them. Well, I give you a special weapon. It's called the switch, capital S. So when you need it, turn it on. When you don't need it, turn it off. Check your mind. Do you turn on the device or the device turns you on? When you have this feeling that this thing is just making me dizzy with joy and rapture, distraction, entertainment, then you're programmed. When you decidedly, consciously turn it on, watch it for an hour and a half and turn it off, you're in control. But when it's six hours a day and you still can't get rid of it, although your frontal lobe is already multiple layers of junk, then you know you're being used by habits that you agreed to. So if you can switch your mind on and off, you can switch all the devices on and off. But this is our original device. If you don't learn to turn this on and off, everything else will use it. All the digital media, all the zeros and ones. You know, it's such a common place, people don't even notice it. I remember vividly in the 90s, when I was trained in Korea, I took the subway. Nine people out of ten were reading the newspaper. One had a mobile device. Nine out of ten. And when they were done with the paper, they put it on the shelf and they left. So the next guy came with empty hands, took the paper, read it for a few stops, and then put it back up there. It was a beautiful system. It was amazing. The end of the day, when it's like 10 p.m., and very rarely, but I had to return that late, I saw a special guy with a big bag in his hands. And he collected all the papers that everybody read on the subway, and he took it to a designated recycling station. No kidding. Now, about 10 years ago, I noticed that these newspapers just died out. They're gone, completely extinct. And 10 out of 10 are in a device, looking at the screen frozen. Even housewives were playing games on their mobile telephones, not just teenage boys, okay? And the first sign that something is really changing was with these large screen Korean mobile phones and they had antennae, not one, two, because the internet was not so fast. So they needed two antennae to watch movies. So they held it like this with 
a foot long antennae, both of them sticking out. And it was taking another person's space on the subway. So he couldn't squeeze so tight because everybody was looking at something. So people's habits changed. They became more individualistic, less caring, less observant, less compassionate. So what does this dependence mean? Does it mean just being informed, being entertained, being hooked, being conditioned or programmed? Not necessarily. But if you don't see through it, if you don't use this special weapon, the switch, we become selfish. It's another S. We have to learn how to turn the self on and off. Then we can use the switch correctly. So what's the best way to work with the Kogan? I don't know. <laughs> and this don't know is your best servant to work with the Kogan. You're one of the smarties, kind of moderately smart, but not unsmart. And that means you can somehow control your mind, but you have used your emotions to do that until recently. So emotions are not the best keepers of your thoughts. You already understand that. Yeah. Sometimes it's like jumping from the frying pan into the fire itself. Okay? Complete don't know means not moving body, not moving speech, not moving mind. Coming back to this point and this point only. That works on the Kongan, not you. We all have that. But if your smart mind, your emotions, whatever intelligence you have works on it, then the biggest job is not done. That means not identifying with your karma. In Zen speech, as Sung San Slim used to put it, put it all down. So when you put it down completely, the Kongan solves itself. You can't crack it open with your intellect. If you did, it was a misstep. Now, if you look at your beginning time, the first couple of interviews, you see, wow, that was easy. Why? Because we made it easy. If you wanted to make it difficult, you would never crack it open. Never. But the system built by Sung San Kun Sunim is very, very clear. At first, it's easy so that you would believe in yourself. You can do this. If you wanted to make it super difficult, it would be like old style Korea. You get one Kongan, go up to the mountain 10 years. Then you come back, hit, no good, another 10 years. So, <laughs> and there are still Zen rooms where this is working. With us, it's different. There is a system, there's a framework. It's like the barrel of a gun. But it's very predictable how it goes. It gets the first touch of velocity, spin, direction, everything that a good bullet needs. And it leaves the barrel. What's that? Two and a half feet? Three feet if the barrel is very long? Then the rest can be a mile. But that mile is dead on target. Whatever happens, if the marksman is good, it hits. But that's up to the first two to three feet controlled environment. Then the rest is clear. So after the first couple of interviews, when the basics are clear, then you can sharpen your intuition and you get less and less help. Less and less hints. So when you are really considered an advanced student and you ask, Oh, Sunim, can you give me a hint? I say, no. When you are an intermediate student, you get one sentence. And when you're a beginner, the whole nine yards. I'm like my own grandmother, <laughs> super compassionately explaining to you everything. But when you're more advanced, less and less. And when you are totally an adult in the Zen environment, no help, because you can do it. And when the solution finally appears, Next is cleaning up. Don't think you did it. it. It wasn't you. It was your Buddha nature. Not your person, not your mind, least of all your precious intellect. 
none of that. So more Kongan practice is necessary. Okay? Köszönöm. Szívesen. So thank you very much for your attention, for doing this retreat together. I appreciate your questions. And I hope that we continue practicing in our respective locations and uh, attain our clarity, which is like space and inside and outside, completely becoming one, thereby liberating ourselves and all beings. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>